Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Todd and CPP, for inviting us here. Um, I think we have a pretty cool story to tell um, since the last time we all met together in Nashville. So I just wanted to, you know, there's been a lot been going on here in Indiana, and and I, you know, and it's pretty cool. So I it just in this national kind of conference and and widespread audience thought it was a good story to tell. Um, but before I get started, how many people in here have heard of LTAP before? Oh wow. Good. Um, so I don't need to go into too much detail on that. It stands for Local Technical Assistance Program. As Tim said, we're at a Purdue University. There's an LTAP tenor in every state. Um, our director, I'll mention, you know, after, you know, Adriana coming up here. Um, our director um, is John Haddock, Professor John Haddock, Purdue University. He did his PhD work down at Auburn as well. And um, so we're, he's a jazz in our office, especially when we're talking about pavements and, and materials. Um, so. Yes, there's that. So as I said, um, so going back, I just wanted to kind of just share with everybody what's happened here in Indiana, particularly on the local level, um, but also on a statewide level since 2016. Um, Indiana is a very conservative state. Um, I think tax is a, is a curse word here in Indiana, and, um, and nobody likes, I, I mean, I mean, even in non-conservative states, I don't think anybody likes the word tax, I guess. Um, um, but it, 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 I don't think Indiana, and don't quote me on this, but before, when I get into this presentation, we raised the gas tax here, just, you know, uh, showing my hand a little bit, in 2017. Um, but before, I think that was the first time Indiana's raised the tax in like 100 years. Um, so it was a significant effort. Um, going back to 2016, um, kind of here's kind of, here's kind of a snapshot of where we were at um, funding wise. Our, our our state gas tax was 18 cents a gallon. It had been essentially that since like 1985 um, or eight, 1988. I think in 1988 it was like 15 cents a gallon. So over by the time we increased it in, in 2000, 2017, 2018, had gone up about three cents, which each penny in Indiana is about 30 million dollars or so. So over 30 years, we, we had a pretty, it was a flat tax, it stayed constant, and um, so our funding levels really didn't change that much over those 30 years. And, and as we all can put two and two together, you know, that doesn't make a good recipe when our health insurance is going up, our wages are going up, everything else, the cost of materials is going up, um, and our funding levels are staying the same. That's not to say, that our, our governor at the time and legislation did other kind of short-term fixes to help supplement our transportation funding, like leasing our toll road across the northern part of Indiana, which helped you know, put some more money into our transportation um, system, but no really kind of long-term sustainable um, kind of major, major changes um, to our, to our um, transportation funding. Um, the other thing I'll just point out on this slide, so, you know, our Indiana gas tax was 18 cents a gallon uh, back in 2016 when we were meeting in Broadway Street in Nashville, which was a really good time. How many people were in Nashville in 2016? All right. Uh, we missed out if you weren't there. That was really a great, a great place, but I won't get too sidetracked on that. Um, total gas tax revenue, um, $566 million, $567 million is what that gas tax um, was bringing in. Um, and then if we, you know, fast forward to where we're at today, uh, our, our gas tax is 30 cents, 33 cents a gallon. Um, our special fuel went up from 16 cents a gallon to 55 cents a gallon. Um, and our, our, our total gas tax revenue um, this last year and for fiscal year 2022 was $981 million. So we've seen some significant increases in our, in our revenues that going into our transportation system. Um, just kind of putting those two side by side just to compare a little bit on, on what some of those changes have been um, over the last seven, eight years. Um, our, our local share, so I mean for our MVH that you see up there, it stands for our motor vehicle highway account. That's probably our largest, most stable. That's where most of our gas tax goes is into this motor vehicle highway account. That motor vehicle highway account then gets shared between NDOT, our state DOT, and, and our locals. So you can see there at the bottom part is kind of what went to our locals, that local share, the motor vehicle highway account. 
in 2016 um, was just shy of $400 million, um, and now we're at you know $572 million. So I think there's about a 40% increase um, if you look at that, the local share of that. So what did we do um, to get there? Um, in 2016, our state legislation, um, it was right after I came home from Nashville, our, our Association of Indiana Counties, um, our county engineers, our cities and towns conferences, we're all having conferences in the fall, and, and our, you know, one of our representatives was going around to these different conferences saying, while this may not be a budget year, um, they didn't want to tackle too much, um, they did want to um, address the local need. I mean, it, it doesn't take a, a scientist to recognize no gas tax, no increase in taxes over 30 years um, and, and looking at inflation, um, that, that, that there is a shortfall in our funding for, for our roadways. Um, but he was also, you know, the representative Soliday was, was very um, data driven and, and he wanted to help the state wanted to help locals increase um, funding for our roads and streets, but he wanted to do it not just based on, you know, the obvious of, a, well, we haven't had a gas tax in 30 years, increase in 30 years, so of course there's an, a shortfall. He wanted it to be a data-driven decision. So I think um, one of the things, one of the bills that was passed that year was establishing, establishing the local road and bridge matching grant fund for for our local agencies, which was new money um, that, that 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 they allocated, um, so it didn't take away money from the state DOT or the state police or any other organization. It was new money coming in, funded at about two hundred million dollars a year. Which, you know, looking at our motor vehicle highway account, which is our most stable account at that time, was about four hundred million dollars a year. So it was a really a significant investment. Um, into our local roads and street program. Um, but one of the requirements for that was you had to have a pavement asset management plan. So in 2016, um, that bill was passed. And, and in early 2017, we went around the state as an LTAP providing training. Um, we worked with the state DOT, Federal Highway Administration, all you know, local agency stakeholders and said, what does pavement asset management look like for our local agencies? Um, also considering that um, there are dozens, if not, I, I can't remember the, the stats off the top of my head, but let's say 50 towns in Indiana that have less than 150 people and less than two miles of roadway. So something that could be trained and taught and implemented at the smallest level, but then also, you know, the city of Indianapolis here, which is the largest um, local agency in Indiana where they have over 3,000 miles of roadway. Um, just in the city of Indianapolis, something that you know that was that built a program for our largest, most complex, and well-funded cities, as well as our smallest um, cities and towns across Indiana. So that was established in 2016, um, and, then, and then in that first year, we went and collected that data. So in 2017, uh, 2016, 2017, um, they had that first. Um, call for projects for this community for this program and they had to supply a pavement asset management plan to, to be eligible for it um, and we in the first year we got 70 we got roadway inventory and condition ratings uh, for 71 of the 92 counties 100 of the 120 cities and 142 of the 450 towns across Indiana so all together that's a I mean that's at least 80 percent of our roadway network now that we know pretty precisely what, you know, how gravel roads, asphalt roadways, concrete roadways, um, brick roadways, what is, our, what is that surface um, inventory information and also a condition. Um, and then we put together a report at the end of that year kind of describing and displaying um, what our inventory looked like, what the condition cost was in order to make um, so that was pretty significant in 2016, and then in 2017, they were able to use that data and also along with, you know, the state DOT data, um, and they raised our gas tax. So making data-driven decisions, um, which was really encouraging coming down from state legislation. Oftentimes, it's hard enough to get our own local elected officials and our own DOTs, you know, built around preservation, you know, built around supporting um, data-driven decisions, but, you know, it, it being pushed down from state legislation 
um, was super encouraging to me, but in 2017, um, they, had a, they passed a bill that raised our gas tax 10 cents a gallon. Um, but the other significant part of that was that they, they built into that bill to, for it to be indexed every year um, for inflation. Now, they capped that inflation at one penny um, per gallon um, per year, um, and, and, and that hasn't been keeping up um, this year, last year, we, we've seen you know, 30 40% increase in our asphalt prices over the last couple of years. So it's not keeping up with inflation, but it, it's been helpful over the last six or seven years um, for that gas tax to go up as well. Um, the other significant part um, of that bill was they, they created a new requirement for the local agencies for that motor vehicle highway account, um, kind of supporting preservation. Um, they, 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 they made a requirement for this motor vehicle highway account that locals had to spend 50% of it on um, construction, reconstruction, and preservation. And they, and they went further in defining preservation. Um, as, you know, and, and I don't have the exact definition in front of me, but basically a proactive treatment, you know, something that's included in your pavement asset management plan. So looking at proactive treatments um, opposed to reactive treatments. Um, now that's also kind of been kind of a source of, of soreness here and for our local agencies because the motor vehicle highway account has been our most flexible account. So we're able to use it to spend it on our, on our wages, on our health insurance, on buying new equipment, all the other maintenance activities um, that our local agencies are having to deal with every, every day. Um, oftentimes that was the funding pot that, 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 that some of those activities and, and expenditures were coming out of. So it's kind of putting a, a hamper on, on how they are funding some things. Um, but there is a, you know, a statewide um, emphasis on preservation. Here's kind of a, a graph showing the asset management plans that we've collected since 2016. So, we, so over, you know, we've been consistently for the last four or five years have been getting complete inventory and condition ratings for all 92 counties in Indiana. We've gotten inventory and condition ratings for all 120 cities and for at least a, and about 75% of our towns in Indiana now. So we're able to, to report um, what our inventory and condition ratings are and our funding needs based on data um, for over 90% of our local roadway network. Um, so kind of proud of that effort and, 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 and some of the fruit that has come out of that bill. Um, one of the other things that we have done, and I'll tap, let's see if I, this will work here. Is that our, so we, we built a website to display this data and I got it on, and so you can come down here and now we, you know, we have all the, you know, the widgets built for our, our payment data and you can see over the last kind of five years statewide, you know, what that breaks down to in good, fair, poor. Um, Yeah, I won't spend too much time here because I can't navigate this. But, you know, on our, our, our bridge side of things, our, our funding side of things, and our, on our pavement side of things, um, being able to help tell that story for our local agencies in Indiana. Let me close this. Get back to there. Um, so some of the things that we've done at LTAP to help support this cause is we created an online class um, for asset management. Um, part of our road builder program, one of our training programs for our LTAP is called the road builder program, road scholar program, where they take, our locals can take um, 12 core classes and build up an, enough credit hours where they're, where they're um, regarded as, as, and then get awarded a road scholar award. So one of, that, one of those classes is on asset management. Um, we go around the state and do in-person training for PASER and pavement management. Um, we've created some spreadsheet tools to help them analyze their pavement networks to calculate what their funding needs are. Um, and then also, you know, we have some GIS capabilities that we can help local agencies that aren't using GIS to help collect um, pavement condition data and, and other data on, the, on our roadways as well. 
Um, we have created an asset management conference that we do um, every year and, uh, and then various pavement preservation um, training. Um, so I wanted to close with here, um, what is PASER? Um, why PASER? Um, I heard this mentioned yesterday, you know, as, as a condition index. Um, and when I was here in Nashville, the re one of the reasons why I, I put this, I want to spend a couple of minutes on this, is when I was in Nashville, you know, back in 2016, talking to some of the pavement asset management people and, you know, here at the conference, and I mentioned PASER, and, and you can see the eyes roll, to be honest, right? And you're like, ah, oh, well, well, it's better nothing, right? I mean, that, that, that was a response that, um, that we got. So I wanted to kind of take a minute to kind of defend it a little bit um, and say, while it doesn't replace all your laser data and, you know, crack density data, all great data to have, especially if you're on 465 or your interstates where you see, you know, 100,000 cars a day, um, but keeping in mind that there's, you know, 86,000 miles of roadway, local roadways in Indiana, and trying to give that snapshot of what condition that, that roadway network's in, um, a, a condition index that um, is sustainable, you know, in order to calculate deterioration, in order to see progress towards our pavement management goals, um, in order to calculate the effectiveness of different treatments, I mean, you have to have a recurring condition rating that is redone every year, every two years or so, um, and, and, and there's a cost of benefit um, to that condition data that comes out of our paving budgets. So something that's, you know, cost effective, beneficial, and helps tell that story, helps us um, at least at a minimum, it may not, you know, and I even listened to a session yesterday where, you know, there's no really payment condition index that will tell you exactly what treatment that you need to do, right? There's other factors and other variables that go into that. So, you know, at a starting point, you know, being able to take our, our condition data and put it into buckets to know is it preservation, is it a minor rehab, is it a major rehab, or a reconstruction. So, that, you know, something along those lines. So, um, and the other thing that I hear a lot is, you know, is pays are subjective, right? You know, it's not repeatable because it's subjective depending on the rater, depending on the person looking at your road, it's gonna change from year to year, so it's not really reliable. So I wanted to, to spend a, a minute talking about that, really. Um, again, um, PASER is what it's not. It, I would say it's not subjective. It's not based on our feelings. It's not based on our previous experiences. Um, what it is, it's an ordered state rating system. So we're looking at our pavements, looking at the type of distresses, the location of those distresses, and the severity of those distresses, to help um, with, with defined criteria in each rating to help define what that rating is for that, that payment condition. Um, another example of an ordered state rating system is our MBI bridge inspections. As, as, as um, Tim mentioned in my bio, as a bridge inspection, um, a bridge inspector before, um, and, and very similar to that, right? I mean, we have our one through nine scale in our bridges, um, that say if there's, you know, shear cracks, moment, deter you, know, you know, different types of deterioration based on the location and the severity of that, we'll drive that condition rating. PASER is a very similar, very similar method to that, um, but what it does require is a pretty training, certification, um, quality assurance. That way um, we are having reliable data and, and confidence in that data. And, there, and there's some additional steps in that that we do have to do as, as PASER raters to do in order to have confidence in that data. Now, I will admit there can be some variability um, between raters um, based on what you see on the road, um, you know, based on, you know, the person and, and, and different conditions. It is a visual survey. Um, so, based on what you see, you may not see everything the same way. So, there can be some variability, but I think a quality assurance program that can help mitigate a lot of that as well. Um, so, just a you know, quick example, you know, we go out to our roadway and we identify you know, the cracking in our, in, our, in our longitudinal joints or along the edges. We look at the, the environmental cracking and, and the frequency of those. Um, will help dictate what that rating would be. Uh, maybe it's the rutting. So we're looking at all the different types of distresses on a pavement and then assigning a condition rating based on the, the limiting or the, or the controlling um, 
um, distress that we see. So that you know, so it, it is repeatable, it is reliable, and um, and and it can be a good place to start. Um, kind of an overview. Um, it's a one through ten scale for those not familiar with Pazer. Nine and ten are no defects. Um, and then that five, six, seven, and eight is that range of, of condition index um, where we see that environmental and age-related distresses are block cracking, our transfers cracking, and then our one through fours are, are designated um, as what we see as structural distresses. So the longitudinal cracking in the wheel path, maybe it's alligator cracking, um, and, and, and significant rutting would all fit into the structural distresses. Um, as far as, as project selection going, um, what we often tell people that you can have a, if you have quality data, you know, with the quality insurance program and, and trained observers out there assigning the condition ratings, you should be able to have a fairly high confidence in selecting, looking at your data and selecting treatments in that six through 10 range. Um, you know, you know, hopefully you have confidence that those are the age-related distresses. So, you know, we're looking at our crack sealing um, segments, we're looking at microsurfacing, you know, you know chip seals, um, putting new surfaces down our roadways. And then we know in our ones and twos, those are our, our obviously failed um, roads um, that are going to require a substantial reconstruction or full depth reclamation or, you know, some structural improvement. Now in that three, four, and five range, we admit that that's not gonna give you that project specific data that you need, but now you can narrow down what segments that you can go back out and, and do truck traffic counts on, maybe do an FDR, uh, or not an FDR, falling weight to FWD on it, um, gain that additional information to be able to you know, look at the rutting, look at the types of distresses and you know, in the, in the, in the extents of those distresses in the segments, and then select the appropriate treatment um, for the roadways in those categories. Um, so in our payment management system, you know, hopefully we have a system that can identify environmental distresses, structural distresses, and other um, functionality um, characteristics as well. Um, PASER there helps really distinguish between environmental and structural distresses. Um, it's not going to tell you what the cross slope of the roadway is. It's not going to tell you what the roughness or skid resistance of the roadway is. Um, but those are, you know, in, 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 you know, in a way that we kind of justify PASER um, in, our, in our treatment selections that we want to be able to treat our roads based on the condition and then prioritize the roadways um, based on the ADT or the roughness. You know, there's other factors in there that will help, uh, you know, increase the benefit in, in doing our asset management plans for, the, for those roadway segments before another one. And then um, just kind of to give an overview of that, again, no structural, dis no dis if you drive up to a roadway, there's no distresses, you know you're in that nine or 10 range. Um, if you see that longitudinal crack in the wheel path or alligator cracking, you know you're in that one to four range. So then you can just kind of work your way down um, and, 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 and selecting the right condition for that roadway based on the rutting, based on the amount of um, alligator cracking or the longitudinal cracking in the wheel path. Now, if you don't see any of those distresses, you know you're in that five to eight range, so we're looking at our, our block cracking, our transverse cracking, or the longitudinal joints and, and the severity of those, and, and then working our way down and selecting the right condition rating for those. So, hopefully that kind of helps um, demonstrate a little bit what we have gone through in Indiana for the last seven or eight years. Um, some of the efforts that we've made um, for the local agencies particularly in help, helping tell their story, helping justify um, their funding needs, and also helping them build payment management systems um, that, that incorporate preservation as key in order for them to um, achieve their, their, their performance measures and their performance goals and their payment asset management plans. So with that, I guess I will take any questions.
our website management, our database management, um, all that, we probably, it's probably less than $250,000 a year. Thanks, Tim.